All right, so we're we're eating um, eating some um, ravioli. I always wonder why ravioli are so overpriced. And there's so few of them. In each so of the Trader Joe's ravioli, that's why. Yeah. And uh, about to watch uh, Kurskis Kirk, Kirk, Act take on the origin of consciousness. I'll be pausing the video and commenting as we go along. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, dinner, uh, March 25th, 2019. All right, let's get started. Consciousness is perhaps the biggest riddle in nature. Stripped to its core meaning, consciousness is what allows us to be aware both of our surroundings and of our own inner state. But thinking about consciousness has this habit of taking us round in circles. We all intuitively know what consciousness is. It's this. It's what you're experiencing here, right now. But once we try to pinpoint just what exactly it is, it leaves us grasping at thin air. And not just us. Philosophers and scientists struggle to define consciousness. Different schools and ideas compete with one another, but no one has come close to figuring it out. Mm -hmm. It's unsettling to realize that we don't understand what makes us aware of ourselves and the world. In this fuzzy area, consciousness and intelligence are also related, although they are not the same. We'll talk in greater depth about theories of consciousness and intelligence in other videos. Yeah, I, I should say I appreciate the fact that they're disentangling consciousness and intelligence from the start because they are indeed not the same thing. And uh, even though they are like correlated in, in very important ways, and uh, there's a reason why we're conscious, um, which is that consciousness has um, benefits for information processing. Um, the reason why consciousness was recruited by natural selection. But but yeah, you can have like hyper-conscious states that are not intelligent at all. Um, but you can also have like intelligent behavior without consciousness. But in, in anima animals, uh, yeah, they're highly correlated. All right. Like much of what makes us human, our consciousness is likely to have evolved from less complex forms as a product of evolution by natural selection. It has probably emerged from an immense several hundred million year sequence of countless microsteps that together make up a sort of gradient of consciousness. What was the first step on this path from the non-conscious to the basic consciousness that ultimately led to the convoluted consciousness we humans enjoy today? Um, yeah, I mean, just one small comment about the um, gradients of consciousness. I think like that has a lot of uh, different meanings as well. Um, I think there's like this: if you're if you're an eliminativist materialist, then you will tend to think that yeah, so there's actually nothing substantial about consciousness, and it's just algorithms upon algorithms. In which case, like talking about like gradients of consciousness makes quite a lot of sense in um, my worldview. Qualia Research Institute and David Pierce, it would be, uh, there, there is a sense in which there can be gradients of consciousness, and that is in the sense of like how intense, how much energy there is bound uh, in your particular uh, experience. Um, but I don't think that's actually, you know, related necessarily with evolution. It might very well be that early evolutionary uh, steps involved extremely intense amounts of consciousness that had some relatively minor computational benefits, but and, and expended massive amounts of calories, but still were worth it. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there's been kind of like a, there's like gradients of consciousness across evolution, because consciousness might have been more intense in the past. And, and there's like some arguments to think that, um, for example, pigs and dogs may actually experience more consciousness than us, just based on the fact that the cortex has a majorly inhibitory role um, in inner functioning. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that. All right, let's continue. <clears throat> Take a stone. The consensus is that a stone is not conscious, though not everyone agrees even on this. Some panpsychists claim that a lump of rock may have an inner life. However, there are no real grounds for any such assumption, since stones never show behavior. Ah. <laughs> um, okay, so like, uh, there, there are 
uh, two views here. One is animism, the other one is panpsychism. Are you confusing the two? Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, like, animists would um, usually have, like, a very fuzzy view, and they may see something like, oh, you know, like, a fork is conscious, and, like, a rock is conscious, a mountain is conscious. That's something you sometimes hear in spiritual circles. But uh, there's a really important question here, which is, like, what is the boundary? Basically, what region of the physical object do you identify with a bound, unitary moment of experience? And... Um, that is something that, like, you know, panpsychists who take physics seriously actually do ask. And they might say something like, hey, like a rock um, is not conscious as a unit. Uh, like this table and like other things that are made of rocks. It's not that, you know, like the, the rigidity boundary corresponds with the boundary of, a, of, of like independent moments of, moments of experience. They would usually say something along the lines of like, uh, we think the crystal, the crystal lattice of a particular... Uh, mineral structure, you have like fleeting moments of bound experience that don't have much intentional content. I mean, they they didn't evolve to represent their environment. They would be just made of raw qualia. Uh, and then there's like this duality between the qualia and then like the behavior from the point of view of uh, an external observer. Um, so a rock would most likely be within a panpsychist view just a, a, a huge bundle of micro experiences interacting. And it's, it's the quality of those micro experiences and the way they're interacting that gives rise to the macroscopic uh, physical properties of it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I guess like I get a little bit triggered when the Kersky Z says like the, there's no grounds to think about this because it doesn't exhibit any behavior. Um, I, I feel like I've heard the term substrate, consciousness substrate. Yeah, yeah the, the substrate of consciousness okay. is, a, is an important concept. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you can roughly divide views of consciousness into three categories. Those that think that the substrate of consciousness is behavioral, basically what is the input-output mapping of a system. Then you have those that think it's algorithmic, basically what kind of information processing the system is doing uh, internally. And then you have uh, implementation level accounts, which is like, hey, like it's actually like the, the physical energy and configuration um, that is like the substrate of consciousness. In which case, yeah, like a rock would be not conscious as a unit, but be made of a lot of micro experiences interacting with each other. All right. Their inner life can neither be proven nor disproven. A more common starting point is with living things. A living thing, or a self, is a part of the universe that sustains itself and makes more of its kind. I take issue <clears throat> with living thing or self. <laughs> makes more of itself. Or what was that? No, uh, a living thing or a self. I see. Which is, uh, I think, like a really wrong way of uh, approaching what life is. Hmm. You have people who have their corpus callosum removed or, or ablated. Um, and um, you could probably argue that there's like two selves in them. Uh, and then you have like florid schizophrenia, right? Or, or like the states disclosed by peak uh, ketamine experiences so that, or dissociatives that basically could be described as be mixed of a, a whole number of different sub-agents um, competing for attention, but none of them like actually, you know, taking hold of, of, of your stream of consciousness. Um, and yeah, I guess like to really kind of like dive into the question of like, whether a living being is a self um, requires you to address things such as the, the binding problem and then like what a self model is. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's like a whole bunch of like hidden assumptions, but so they've, they've already gone and made a bunch of them. Yeah, I mean, just like working with uh, imprecise assumptions. Uh, yeah, a living being is not a self. And in the future, we might be able to merge with each other um, in terms of like adding bridges between brains. Um, so yeah, like the, the boundary between oneself and another, um, currently I would think is more conventional than ground truth. Do you think they're going to talk about um, those conjoined twins? It could be. It could be. Um, yeah, let's, let's. Do you think they'll they'll like use that case to question their assumptions? Maybe. It seemed like they said it in passing, kind of like a living being or a self. Okay. But yeah. I, I don't know. Let's let's see. To do so, it needs energy. And this is where an awareness of the world comes in handy. 
The original function of consciousness was probably to direct a mobile self that was short of energy to a fresh supply of food. On the smaller scales of life, you don't need to be aware to find food. Trichoplax adherens, one of the simplest of all animals, moves around haphazardly. It slows down in the presence of food and speeds up in its absence. This is highly effective and makes the tiny creature spend more time where there is food than where there is not. But it never moves in a particular direction towards a particular target and there's no need for it to be conscious of its environment. The first major step towards consciousness was probably taken when mobile selves started to move themselves directionally. Moving towards what was good for them, say food, and away from what was less good, say someone else who thought that they were food. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, I think like, it's very likely that complex consciousness definitely evolved with uh, self-propelled um, organisms that actually required to make a online model of what was going on around them. And it probably turned out that building analog conscious uh, representations of the environment were, was useful to navigate it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, not a, this is not a necessary condition because you can definitely disentangle your conscious experience from uh, outside behavior, for example, in lucid dreaming, even just dreaming in general. But also, yeah, just like you can induce paralysis and that doesn't mean consciousness is not there. Um, however, as an evolutionary um, incentive, uh, it, it definitely works out. Uh, yeah. Uh, that said, I, I would I would kind of like add the the note that there's two there's many meanings of the word awareness, but there's one word uh, would, that you may describe as um, kind of like functional awareness. That is that in some sense you're representing the environment, uh, and there's like another word which would be another sense of it, which would be phenomenal awareness, which is when it actually becomes conscious. And in principle, you could have a system that is functionally aware. This is like compute like the computer with robot arms. And Lots of stuff. Yeah, or like a, a self-driving car. Hmm. It's functionally aware of its environment. It may not be phenomenally aware of it. Mm -hmm. But that might help, or might not. It may, yeah, it probably like, would. If you know how it. to do it, yeah. Um, yeah, you have a really deep understanding of uh, the computational benefits of consciousness. Hmm. Uh, otherwise, probably, you might just like, you know, mangled worlds, it yeah. might not be super useful. <laughs> yeah. Right. Take Dugisia tigrina, a tiny worm known for its funny face. Sometimes the worm is hungry, and sometimes not. This means that when it moves, the worm self is not simply producing an automatic response to an external stimulus, but that its actions depend upon its inner physiological state, whether it's hungry or sated. When it's just eaten, the worm is less energetic, but when starved for a while, it will move itself in the direction of tasty things. It uses chemoreceptors on its head to smell its environment and guide it in the direction where the scent of food is strongest. After finding and eating a meal, our worm buddy heads back to a dark, sheltered spot to digest it in safety, until it's hungry again. But animals that blindly follow their sense of smell don't have a concrete objective in view. They still lack any sense of where they are heading. So the next step on the ladder of consciousness is to add some perception at a distance, like vision. Is this, the, is this like the way this video is going to go? This feels very like outdated. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like this, this video is taking the line of um, consciousness has something to do with algorithmic and behavioral processes. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps automatically assuming that if it looks like you are representing the environment, that you're actually representing it inside you, which is not, <clears throat> not the case in, in the, because you can have um, lookup tables, like you can have like neurological lookup tables without the need to actually make an online um, real-time representation of the environment. You can, to some extent, behave like you actually have an internal representation of the environment, as long as your lookup table is like adequately adapted to to the surrounding environment. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it seems like this uh, video is probably gonna go ahead and uh, 
assume that access consciousness or behavioral consciousness um, is the same as phenomenal uh, consciousness. Vision adds context and depth to our world. With vision comes a sense of the space we and our food exist in. It adds a whole new dimension to awareness and is a huge step towards more familiar consciousness. An optical apparatus like an eye enables us to visualize our goal and lock onto it. But even at this stage, a self is only able to pursue its food as long as it sees it. So the next logical step needs to happen on the inside. To visualize food in its absence, for example, a self needs to create some sort of inner representation of the world. Now an animal can continue looking for food even when it escapes its sensory range. Because of this inner representation of what is relevant in the world, it can remain focused on its food and its desire to get it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, now it's talking about like internal representations. Um, yeah, at the same time though, an internal representation doesn't imply consciousness. Uh, at least not like in terms of like qualia and the binding problem, and the causal property of experience. But ooh, how, how likely do you think they're going to say the word failure? I wouldn't say, uh, probably 40%. Okay. I mean, they, they have gone so far as to talk about internal representations. Okay. I guess, yeah. So <laughs> we got like five minutes left. Yeah, we got five minutes left of the video. Our self now exists in a world it can get familiar with. The ability to remember things has emerged. Thanks to memory, animals can be distracted from a pursuit for a few seconds, but quickly continue their path afterwards. A related phenomenon is called object permanence. This describes our awareness that things continue to exist even when we can't see them. This cognitive skill is enjoyed by some mammals and birds, and perhaps other animals too. Human babies tend to develop this ability around the time they turn eight months, while baby chickens show this ability within a day or two of being born. The capacity to remember a thing in its absence suggests at least a basic sense of time. <laughs> I just want to comment on how weird the studies are that show that eight months old um, babies have like object permanence um, because they can't speak right like how how do psychologists know that <laughs> they actually experience object permanence um, and they basically what they do is like they quantify how surprised they are by different situations <laughs> <laughs> so they the experiment I, I took a class on developmental psychology and one of the things I remember from that is that they were basically they would like put an object behind um let's say like a, a kind of like a flat wooden sheet or something and uh it's just like casually it's like oh you know your mom is like putting an object behind it and then they would like um sur surreptitiously like get rid of it from from that from the you know a way that the baby wouldn't be able to know and then like they they let the flat surface just like fall it's like wait wh where wasn't there like something there that would like prevent it from like fully falling um, but obviously the baby can tell you it's surprised, right? At least like not verbally. So the way in which they quantify this is by looking at how, how long the baby stares at the object. So like the, when, you know, when they remove the object and like the, the sheet falls completely, like the baby stares like for much longer than either when there was no object to begin with or when an object is there to like actually prevent its fall. Okay. So that's like the surprise quantification paradigm. And, um, um, yeah, adorable. yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like, otherwise, how, do, how would you know, like, a baby actually has up to permanence, um, I feel like, right, there, <laughs> weren't there those, those videos where you do, where you throw a sheet up and then hide for your, from your dog? Oh, yeah, like, they get real, dog is like, <laughs> some of the dogs, like, stand there for a while, they get really upset, yeah, <laughs> some dogs, like, immediately, like, flip out, <clears throat> yeah, was this video of like this guy in like military tours or something and then the the girlfriend is there and then like when it falls is like the guy who came from this long tour oh yeah yeah the dog is super happy but probably also very confused right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah happy, happy <laughs> rides 
the surprise. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, all right. <laughs> You're here now. So, yeah, object permanence. That's an important feature of, of intelligence and presumably useful um, to have consciousness for it. A sense of time is a big step on the ladder of consciousness. It may also enable a self to look forward from the present moment and anticipate the future. Adult chickens, for example, are able to resist a meal put in front of them if they expect to receive a bigger meal as a prize for holding back for a while. This sort of delayed gratification means there is an ability to visualize a reward that only exists in the future, which can be quite a challenge even for adult humans. Western scrub jays are experts in delayed gratification. They show an even more elaborate sense of the future when they hide food in a cache to retrieve it at a later date. The scrub jays will even rehide their food if they become aware that a potential thief has been watching them. This means that they know that there are other hungry selves out there who are aware and see the world from their own different perspective. Hmm. Just wanted to add, I'm highly skeptical that delayed gratification has anything to do with consciousness. Um, it has to do with consciousness in as much as it reveals that you have a very complex and detailed model of the world that involves like long spans of time. Um, although you could also implement delayed gratification with intense present feelings that have nothing to do with long-term models. But more strikingly, I would say that if delayed gratification has something to do with consciousness, um, or amount of consciousness, presumably that would indicate that people who have are very impulsive, you know, or very, uh, you know, like uh, heroin junkies, might be less conscious. Which I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a very likely. This uh, is a direct implication of what they're saying. In this video. Potentially, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't think a heroin junkie is less, uh, less conscious because of lack of delayed gratification. Crafty scrub jays can sort of read the mind of their fellow birds. This ability to mind read is crucial for complex levels of consciousness. By putting yourself in the position of others, you can outsmart a rich competitor or empathize with a hungry friend. Language takes the ability to read minds and represent what is absent to a whole new level. Words enable us to construct hypotheses about the world, make detailed plans, and to communicate them with others. Words enable us to think about ourselves and our place in the universe, and even about our own consciousness, which is something we'll be doing more in future videos. So what is the origin of our consciousness? It probably began as the directed motion of a hungry self towards a source of food, with the survival benefits this gave it over competitors that moved at random or not at all. It probably all started with the urge for more food. So even with the sophisticated consciousness that allows us to dream about space, build skyscrapers or obsess about novels, it's not surprising that we can't stop thinking about where we'll get our next meal. Collectively, we've put so much thought and ingenuity into getting food that we can now just get our food to come to us with little conscious effort. This video is part one of a three-part video oh. series relating to big questions of life and the universe, made possible by a grant from the Templeton World well, Charity nice. Foundation. Do you, know what you can. I mean, Templeton Foundation is a uh, yeah. They give grants to people who try to put. The pieces of reality together. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's actually, it might be a, a good lead for people like us and other people studying consciousness in general. But um, they do generally have kind of this like bias towards uh, giving grants to people who want to prove religion and spirituality or show that spirituality and religion are still relevant. Um, which yeah limits to. But but you know I mean like it's they they're also like pretty uh, genuine and like figuring out consciousness. And, hmm. and hey, like, I, I take very seriously uh, super intense, like, spiritual experiences as well as, like, high valence experiences in general that go outside the, the human range of experiences. So, in that, in that sense, I think we could be aligned with them. Um, but yeah, just to, I guess, like, recap, provide, <laughs> um, recap a little bit. Yeah, I think, like, the, the video um, uh, did not, did not bring, like, valence, which is pretty crucial, basically what makes an experience feel good or bad. Um, they, 
do seem to basically uh, have like an implicit uh, functionalist or behaviorist account of consciousness where it has to do with uh, information processing and world simulation, uh, simulating your, your environment. Um, they definitely dismissed panpsychism with, uh, by just saying that there's no behavior in rocks <laughs> and therefore they, can't, they, they don't have any consciousness in them, which is not really a strong dismissal once you consider all the other ways in which panpsychism can tie together a lot of other puzzles. Um, including like basically how how there's like the possibility of, of consciousness to begin with in what is presumably a physical universe of insentient matter the you know quote unquote hard problem of consciousness uh, might be solvable with uh, panpsychism uh, and also yeah I mean David Chalmers basically says that yeah panpsychism could help solve the the hard problem of consciousness he just doesn't see how panpsychism can solve the binding problem um, which is basically what, yeah, David Pierce and, and uh, the Quality Research Institute uh, is, is trying to solve. Uh, and um, which, yeah, may, may actually be able to provide panpsychism a, a leg up. Um, and I, I would add that, yeah, panpsychism is also somewhat of a confused view to, to an extent a much better formalization might be dual aspect monism, where basically um, it's not so much that the intrinsic nature of reality is either conscious or physical, but rather both physical and conscious properties are different projections of something that is uh, neither. Um, there's ways of projecting that thing uh, in ways that either you look at it as a, a quilia or you look at it as uh, physical behavior. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess like this is uh, uh, reacting to Kurzgesagt Act uh, consciousness, uh, origin of consciousness video. Uh, yeah, do you have anything to add? <laughs> okay cool cool and uh thanks for joining us in uh uh dinner all right <laughs> take care